labyrinthine myopia it's a new term uh, and i'll be talking about this is a case based uh, myopia uh, ic so how to deal with uh, the new myopia or the covid myopia so first case that i'll talk about are actually two cases together they're siblings so meet uh, kishiv and uh, shivani the siblings from delhi both came to me pre covid in 2019 as two year old and a five year old they had a family history of myopia and both their parents mom had a minus 2 had laser for that and now she was not wearing glasses and dad still wears a minus 1.5 so not very severe myopics but both of them were very very uh, aware of myopia and were very worried that their kids might get it and uh, they wanted to know if the ten- there's any tendency for myopia in these kids and so they both underwent a regular checkup uh, plus i added an axi lens which was 2018 2019 not a, some something i was doing very routinely but i added that for them there's a cyclopedic refraction io uh, routine there was 66 n6 their refraction was a plus 0.75 plus 0.5 um, so both were f- fine according to me so what i suggested was you know you keep coming back to me every 3 months every 6 months we'll keep checking we'll keep uh, keep this under tabs so uh, we know there are a lot of articles about parental myopia having an effect so the parents were right when they were thinking of myopia as a problem in their kids lifestyle modifications is what i advised them that was no screen uh, as much as minimal as possible at their age and frequent regular follow ups and outdoor activities so i told them to go out in the sun play more uh, be less indoors uh, don't confine them that's what i told them then the unthinkable happened covid 19 and there was a lockdown so pre covid everything we told them was increase your outdoor activities go green nature and nurture is the best reduce your screen time increase your reading distance uh, avoid dim light exposure uv and vitamin d theories were floating and we told them all about that post covid what happened there was increase indoor activities no where to go go screen instead of go green online classes went to online games increase screen time reading distance suddenly dropped to 30 cm totally un uh, monitored can't avoid dim light exposure no sun and no sunlight so screen time versus health has been talked about uh, the effects on the child were quite a lot uh, parents were working from home so they did give the screen more often than you can even imagine and it became a habit so that that's what they say that 20 days is all it takes to form a habit so this habit was more than 20 days because the quarantine and the lockdown was more so increase risk in progression of myopia happened mental health and developmental stress anxiety loss of social skills behavior skills in these kids happened which we often don't talk about and miss as ophthalmologists regular sleep patterns were disturbed and habit forming uh, started so the various articles came in papers but of course that most of us stopped using the paper as well fighting this new normal when i had online consultations i did tell them fight the screens you know get large screens go away from as far as you can uh, get your room well lit let sunlight come in follow the 2020 rule wear blue block glasses which i don't know if they work or not optimize font size avoid the recreational tv viewing but i don't know how much was practiced So 2021 schools reopened quarantine myopia had struck uh, both Krish and Shivani came with uh, complaints of unable to see their smart boards so the parents nightmare became true uh, axial lens was done the cyclopedic refraction was done and both had become myopes so one was on 2.5 and 3.25 so now we know treatment of myopia progression again skin hygiene environmental factors get them on glasses get them the right uh, number don't over correct don't under correct uh, contact lens can be an option but of course not in the, uh, I, i wouldn't do that for kids because i'm a little more wary orthokeratology again comes in the contact lens bracket so something i avoid and pharmacological intervention so which method to choose So pharmacological uh, therapy has been most effective less side effects long term effect of mediastin cyclopedia now with the new availability is almost not there it's spectacle based wearing glasses anyway so might as well give them this uh, not a bad idea but the the fact is it was not very available at that moment and also very expensive contact lens again i told you i was a little wary so what did i do i started with pharmacological intervention so what does that do it retards the axial and elongation by affecting the release of dopamine neurotransmitter and synthesis of glycosaminoglycans in the sclera so that way we control the lengthening 
So that's what we did. The atom study did talk about this. We spoke about this in our previous master class. So the moment we started this, Krish started stabilizing with these interventions. But his sister Shivani, who was younger and faster developing more and higher myopia, was not controlled. We decided to offer parents an additional option, uh, banking on another theory, not just dopamine, maybe peripheral refraction. So we spoke about bifocals of pals. We know both about bifocals and pals. I'll describe them a little bit. We spoke on new spectacles like halter dims for them or orthokeratology. So bifocals and pals, basic rational is, is to optimize accommodated accuracy for near task and minimize the retinal blur. Basically, uh, getting a myopic defocus in the periphery, thereby preventing the hyperopic defocus and elongation. There was a comet trial which said that, you know, bifocals uh, did, uh, the pals didn't do that great. Comet 2 also uh, was repeated and also was clinically unimportant. So we know that bifocals do much better than progressive lenses in these cases. So new lens, new uh, lenses also available. We have the Myo kits. Let me see if I can show you this. So it basically comes with a. The top half creates uh, corrects the myopia, and supplies clear vision. And the bottom active zone is where the reading happens, and that will cause the myopic defocus. So this is how it looks like. So when the child is reading, and the central part will give the vision and that's the defocus that can happen and that defocus causes elongation so when the reading is taken care of by the pal part the defocus is stopped and the elongation is stopped so there's another one uh, there's a lot of studies on this also which spoke about how effective this is then uh, came the Myovision. So Myovision Pro is now available, another option that was available at that time. So this talks about how the periphery of the lens will be uh, cutting out any peripheral refraction. And the central will provide the sh sharp vision for correcting myopia. So this was one of the first ones to come up with the peripheral defocus theory treatment. So this is how peripheral defocus starts. So when you have a hyperopic defocus, that can cause the eye to elongate. And that leads to increase in progression of myopia. But with these glasses, the peripheral rays which are blocked, they control it much better. Contact lens, of course, work much better than glasses because they also move with your eye. So, but again, contact lens in kids, that's something that is a discussion for tomorrow. We also have orthokeratology, which works with a similar peripheral defocus uh, theory uh, mechanism. So this is their timeline. So their axial lengths were increasing. Krish, it, it somehow stabilized very well with just pharmacological intervention. And I ended up giving them DIMS because DIMS was something which was available and made sense to me at that moment. And DIMS along with atropine worked for Shivani. So sometimes you have to understand it's not just one theory you have to go after, you can go after both the theories and get a combination therapy working for you. So this is DIMS. Uh, I don't know if time persists, I can talk about this. So it DIMS basically is defocus incorporated in multiple segments. This was developed in Hong Kong uh, University. This design compromises of a 9 mm central optical zone and 33 mm annular zone with multiple 1 mm segments, having a relative positive power of 3.5 plus. And close inspection requires uh, to see the lens light that you won't normally see it otherwise. So it, the, optically it looks good, cosmetically also. And the study was done 160 children of two year trial and it did pretty well. It was good enough uh, as per the company even to look after without pharmacological intervention. I use it with pharmacological intervention. Hall technique is also now available, which is high aspheric uh, lens slits. Um, if time persists, I think I'll skip this because I have another case. So another siblings, uh, now this is how they look. So another kid, Aryan, nine year old, no history of parental myopia. He came to me. Uh, he had documentation from a previous eye checkup pre-COVID and he was 66N6 uncorrected. And auto ref which was given was a cylindrical number of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, which is rightfully not given. So this avid reader came to us in 2020, just after the first wave. Mother says he goes for screen, uh, bo reads books a lot. She doesn't want to stop him, but that's what it is. Now his refraction is minus 3.75 in this two years. So COVID really made him read a lot or 
do a lot of near activities, ab absence of outdoor activities, and this is what happened. So this was his binocular posture. So what did I do? So basic tip off points. Now he's also his axial length is close to 26 millimeters. So you want to start as soon as possible. So these are the cases I start immediately. I don't even wait for a follow up. And I started him on uh, pharmacological treatment. Second wave came, pa uh, parents had continued drops nightly for five months and they said they didn't have enough stock for a month or two. They missed those two months. Screen and reading uh, near where were all time high. Now again, there was a change of 0.27 and 0.22. So I decided to go ahead and uh, restart the treatment twice a day. And also uh, when he came further and there was again a change, I started him on DIMS also. So not only the atropine concentration, but you can also play around with the dosage. So subsequently, he's been uh, following up and his myopia uh, progression has stalled. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. That was uh, two very interesting cases. Uh, so we'll be having, a, let me just run through the talks today. So we're going to have, we had new myopia by Dr. Aditya, progressive myopia by Dr. Jitendra Jethani, resistant myopia by me, complex myopia by Dr. Prachi, who will be run, who's not here, but she'll be running a video uh, which I'll play for you, and the future of myopia control by Dr. Kuhebi. So thank you, Dr. Aditya. Very interesting cases. I request Dr. Jethani to kindly talk about the progressive myopia. Um, so, for lack of time, we have one hour session, uh, so we can take the questions at the end. I request everyone to just note down your questions if you have any, and then we'll run through them in the end. Thank you so much. Uh, so, I will be talking about uh, progressive myope. So, before we, I mean, uh, the the computer is yet to boot up. Boot or no? Achha. So before uh, before I have the opportunity to have my slides, I would just say that what exactly is a progressive myope? So when when we see patients of uh, you know when we see a patient of myopia, we have to understand that most of the myopes do progress with age, and so we are we are just being uh, you know we do most of the investigations to find out whether in the next visit they have actually progressed or not. So what is progression? Progression is any myope who's progressing beyond 0.5 diopter in a year or the axial length is progressing more than 0.2 to 0.3 millimeter now this 0.2 0.3 millimeter has been arbitrary mainly because of two reasons one is because of the age because at younger age they progress more quicker and at the old the patient is a progressor and we have to start some sort of treatment and the same definition is used for patients who, who are who are on atropine or who are on dims or who are on halt whether they are responding or not so they, if they are still progressing beyond that particular range then they are dubbed as non responders to that particular uh, kind of treatment like if if you are putting 0.01% and patient is still progressing beyond 6 months beyond six months or one year we have to keep doing the refraction which should be cycloplegic refraction and we have to uh, take into consideration the axial length and one important thing that i have seen in axial length is that you know instead of uh, actually taking the raw data of axial length if you convert it into iel power it becomes much easier to explain it to the patient because you get a bigger difference in power than the axial length so axial length change will be 0.2 millimeters but when you it, it is the same thing, but it just magnifies the thing. And so you can easily show that, you know, your uh, power has jumped from, see this IL power has jumped. So that is an objective treatment, objective way of finding out. Cycloplegic refraction is definitely a sub more of a subjective way because my cycloplegic refraction would be different from somebody else. That happens frequently with a lot of people. But if you use adequate cycloplegia, it should be same with all the setups. There are any questions meanwhile, we can take them up. Can you load the presentation? Jitendra Jaitani. Second, this laptop is not running. So with regards but to the, presentation load kar yeah, the new myope, um, one thing which I have seen is uh, the new myopes, it's very important for two histories. One is a history of parental myopia, the second is a history of lifestyle. These two will it's ideally decide how aggressive one we need to treat years. them. The third thing which I do personally is do a peripheral refraction 
and uh, based on the peripheral refraction i decide whether the child needs atropine or dims so ideally the younger the patient more aggressive the myopia i prefer atropine as a treatment and the older the patient hmm. with a probably um, less of parental myopia then i and with a relative peripheral hyperopia i tend to choose uh, spectacle designs so i think yes we are on yeah so at this point of time i i don't Uh, give uh, the lenses primarily. I would start them on atropine first because uh, you know the lenses are expensive and there will be patient who we may lose them out. So once they are with you, no, once they are putting atropine and they have faith that you are doing something for their myopia, then when you tell them that you know uh, you should use lenses, they would they are more uh, and there is no no reason why a peripheral hyperop should not use atropine. Yes. Yeah. i understand that if there is no peripheral hyperopia you should not use uh, dims but regardless it uh, dims helps even if it is not peripheral hyperopic that was but the dim- reason why i showed the siblings coming from the same parents one controlled very beautifully on atropine the other needed atropine plus dims so it's not always one way it i think combination works the best but that's expensive so start with something basic is what i do Yeah. So, uh, in my second case, that's exactly what happened. So, child was seen somewhere else, and it was absolutely normal. And then he came post COVID. It was minus three point five, but his axial length, which I did, was closer to twenty five point eight. So, that's closer to twenty six mark. In those cases, I immediately start uh, with the risk that they may stop in between and all. But I explain everything, and I explain the. I make it sound like they've got something very, 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 very serious, so that they follow up. That's the only thing you can do. And if you scare them enough, they will follow up, and then yeah, that's where it works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah. Request uh, Dr. Jethani to just uh, stick to the time. We're running short of time. It's not visible on. Uh, yeah. It's not. You can see here no, and no, maybe change. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I can great. now. I can do that. Great. Great. So uh, this was a. Uh, this was basically a patient who. actually presented post covid in uh, march 2021 with a uh, you know it just began the myopia had just started we uh, did the cycloblastic refraction we did most of the work up which we even otherwise do and the axial length was not very myopic uh, normal near point of accommodation everything else was normal so normally when a patient comes to us we try to find out and we try to tell them that you know this is this this child may progress you have to do environmental modifications you have to stop doing near work and uh, that is how we sort of prime them up uh, f- uh, first 3 months they we call them after 3 months uh, patients the the bad part of uh, myops is that you know when you give them glasses and they are able to see 66 they don't come back to you till they do, they stop seeing 66 yani yeah, they will come back after 6 months even if you if you tell them that you come back after 3 months i have to do some work up they will come after their cooling period they once they are not able to see the board or their frame breaks that is the point that they will come back to you so patient uh, took his 6 months came back to us had progression so we documented it we told them that you start atropine once uh, once at night and uh, th- so this was in 2021 we used to give them once at night nowadays in most of the patients we have started giving them uh, twice a day but uh, so this particular patient increased after 5 uh, 6 months so we told them to increase the frequency to twice a day and patient still progressed further uh, in july 2022 so the so the first refraction was done in uh, I-, i think it was in where was it Yeah, March and this is in July 2022. So uh, clearly they, he was responding, but he was not responding as much as we would like uh, the kid to re- respond. Uh, this is the uh, open field auto refractor that uh, Dr. Shruti was talking about to do peripheral refraction. Now, and uh, Dr. Aditya rightly said that you know he showed some videos how peripheral refraction. So this is an uncorrected myop. and uh, so the, the the light will fall here in the periphery and it is not focused on the retina once you give the glasses it the central part is clear sharp image but in periphery there is a hyperopic defocus which means that light is uh, focusing behind and uh, so this was uh, uh, this was a solution we made a small device to 
do peripheral uh, peripheral refraction the patient was progressing and normally we do peripheral refraction in these patients we we uh, take a retinoscope and uh, ask them to fix on 22 degrees on each side we want to do peripheral refraction which is 20 30 degrees in the periphery on each side so that is the whole concept of peripheral refraction that either he can turn his head and you can do the refraction or they can move their eyes this is just a device to facilitate and to know that it, how much it is so this will this will just calculate at 22 degrees but what you have to tell the patient is to look at that particular point and then you have to do the refraction from that particular point where from where you are doing central refraction so you have to sit right straight in front of the patient tell him to look on the right tell him to look on the left do the refraction then again you repeat it for the other eye now it it is very it is not that difficult it is actually very easy it is easier compared to open field auto refractor if you have a grip of retinoscope see you know that you have uh, you have uh, uh, the end point on the central uh, this thing you have already you know it is minus 2 so now what you want is you want to see whether it is width on in the periphery or not so whenever there is a hyperopic refraction there will be a width movement so you just have to tell the patient to look here and uh, move your streak immediately you will see whether there is width or it is same or it is against so even if there is a width of 0.75 it means there is significant peripheral hyperopic refraction and these are the patients which are good for dims or for halt lenses any power more than 0.75 is significant enough for peripheral hyperopic defocus that is the that is the whole point so it is not that difficult that is the point i was trying to make this was uh, basically the whole gamut the whole idea the whole uh, hypothetical ideas of making dims and all started from this particular gentleman who was sitting in his lab in houston and he published his article in which they basically ablated the retina the macula of the macau monkeys not really the macula they actually ablated the central 20 degrees of around the fovea and then they uh, then they sort of waited the eyeball size still grew and so they concluded that it is actually the peripheral retina which was responsible for eye growth and then they did multiple experiments they i think they published it in 2012 iovs 2013 2015 2016 there was a last article by the by the whole group of earl smith uh, junior 3 and they basically tried to show that it is the peripheral retina if you ablate the nasal part the temporal part starts growing if you ablate uh, superior part and that is how they have uh, this is taken from their article of later years not from the 2009 one article where they are trying to show that one part of the retina is growing more than the other part so there is asymmetrical growth of the uh, retina and this is the refraction of that particular patient uh, more important is this this idea which uh, uh, aditya showed in his slides that you know whenever you give a dims or a halt you are basically trying to create a myopic defocus so at this point of time i reserve this particular treatment for my myop, progressive myops who are progressing beyond uh, once we put atropine and still if they are progressing we go to this but uh, Dr. Shruti is absolutely right in saying that you can do peripheral refraction as a primary this thing and prescribe them dims. This is uh, same the stillest lens. We have those lenses here. We can finish the uh, talks and then see how these lenses actually look like. Uh, there are there is uh, there are some new uh, type of lenses which are uh, which are made in India. They have uh, tried to make uh, near vision glasses. Basically, they have made holes in that, and you can because myopes can see for near. so they have made holes in that and peripheral part is plus uh, 4.5 so uh, peripheral defocus would reduce the hyperopic defocus in periphery the refraction sort of stabilized in this particular uh, our patient uh, myop but uh, our own study uh, so this was over and above atropine we did not stop atropine atropine was still being used twice a day and on the top of it uh, stillest was prescribed this was not part of the study of the paper which we published on dims sorry presented on dims so this is how uh, as i said this is how we do things right now maybe uh, because uh, myopia may we are changing uh, our practice every 6 months or 1 year or 2 year depending on what the evidence comes what is the level of evidence and what everybody else is doing 
So if there is an axial myopic progression, this is very important. We have to document that there is an axial myopic progression. We are not treating myopia. I know I keep repeating this, but uh, we have to document axial myopic progression, start low concentration atropine. I have not put 0.01% or 0.05% because we are using 0.05%, but at this point of time, we are using mainly 0.01%. If patient is progressive, we will go to peripheral refraction, peripheral defocus lenses, and then better myopia control. Ortho K, uh, I have not uh, been able to use much, so I don't incorporate it as in the algorithm of my practice. But if you have good uh, ortho K person, or if you are good in ortho K, maybe you can use that particular option also. So thank you so much. It's a wonderful talk, sir. Uh, so, you. of course, you can see like different opinions coming around like this. But uh, what Dr. Jitani says is a perfectly logical sequence that we followed. The last slide, I think, was of immense value. Uh, so, I think next I would be talking on the resistant mind. No. Uh, new myopia, progressive myopia, which was covered very beautifully. Now I'm going on to the next uh, uh, set, which is the resistant myopes, the myopes who don't actually uh, uh, respond to the first line of treatment. So we'll be discussing a few cases. So the first case is a 14 year old girl. She had a new onset myopia minus 2.5 uh, with a sill in the right eye, left eye minus 1.5. Normal binocular vision, all other parameters were completely okay. So this is her chart. If you can see, she started off with 2.5 and 1.5. Through this, uh, uh, at the next visit, she progressed to 3.25 in both her eyes. And of course, there was a corresponding axial length elongation. Now here you can see, uh, it goes without saying that refractive error measurements without axial length at this point um, do not really correspond. So it is important and imperative that we recommend to do axial length measurements along with uh, uh, cycloplegic refraction. So now at this point, I start the child on low dose dihydropine. That will be my first uh, mode of uh, correcting it. So this was back in 2021. And you can see that for up to Feb 22, the child was perfect, maintained. And in fact, atropine has an excellent effect. But what you see in July 22, you see that there's a small increase in the right eye and a very small increase in the left eye as well. And this is where you are caught in a confusion what to do for this child. And at this point, I was like, okay, why is this happening to this mm -hmm. child? Because it was nicely responding for one year. And by the end of second year, there is a small increase that tends to happen. So it is not an uncommon situation. Many kids, I tend to see this by the end of their second year, they have this kind of a response where there's a small increase. One thing you have to look at is compliance. Are they using the drops correctly? Saturation effect, is the drug actually reaching its threshold work? And is there a growth spurt for that child? This child is 14 years old. She's going to become, you know, she's in that growth spurt age. And the fourth thing is, how is her near work? So this child is probably going into a 10th, 12th exams, and probably that could be an additive effect. Now, at this point, these reasons were out. What should I do next? So the first is to change to twice a day dosage. That is my first immediate thought that came to my mind. Or should I change to a higher concentration? There are no ready-made bottles. We have to, we may have have to compound the drops and give it separately or third is to change to spectacle options now these were my options but what i did notice and you would also notice here is i just took a look a little deeper you see the mesobic pupil size of this child this was the first visit when the child came it was 6.1 before starting atropine this was the second visit when the child was actually doing really well you can see the small dilated effect like 8.3 mm look at the third visit when the child came to me with the actual increase you can see the eye pupil has actually gone back to 6.1 for. So at this point, I realized the child has not been compliant with the drops and on constant probing and asking the child actually answered that yes, I've not been putting and the parents don't have a clue because you know, they're so busy in their life. They don't see how often the child is putting not many parents actually put the drops the 14 years old, they think oh, they can take care of themselves. So it's very important at this point, because this patient had a compliance problem. Once I spoke to the child and reinforced it six months later, they were back on track and the uh, myopia had stabilized. So the lesson number one, one was if your child is on low dose atropine and they are not responding too well, always check the compliance. That's lesson number one, which I had. The second case here, you can see this was another 
uh, uh, 12 year old girl again new onset myopia uh, you can see she was started on atropine at some point and suddenly you see after 6 months she's still progressing how do i call her a a a a, a, a non responder is because the previous 6 months 0.5 the next 6 months on atropine still 0.5 so there is absolutely no effect of dilute atropine on the uh, the axial length so this is what i call a non responder so they are, she's not a poor responder she's a non responder now at this point i went back to the whole scenario i asked for the lifestyle everything was the same it was it didn't change of course in fact her lifestyle habits had in, improved over time so what had changed was that i did a peripheral refraction and that is a point i realized that uh, we do a peripheral so sir had shown a very interesting way of uh, new innovation which he had created but i do a more rustic way where i asked the patient to fixate straight and i move nasally and temporally the same effect is achieved you can see when i move temporally i look for the thing so it is very important the child wears the glasses the child has to wear the corrected glasses the child you have to put the working distance correction so that you emetropize the mm-hmm. primary gaze so it is important to emetropize the primary gaze and then move nasally and temporally to look for with movement so i just look for with movement i don't even correct mm-hmm. and see how much with movement so if there is a with movement then that means there is a peripheral hyperopic defocus now if there is a peripheral hyperopic defocus you put them on spectacle option so mm-hmm. i put this child on dims and you can see that after 6 months she had actually stabilized and one year f- through now and she's still stabilized so at this point again my lesson number 2 also this is just my results with dims we have about 30 eyes now and you can see the progression on refractive error is 70.1% control and axial length is 88.9% still i'm 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 quite happy with the way dims is working so my lesson number 2 whenever a new, you have a progressive myopia and you're wondering should i do spectacle should i do low dose atropine i would do a relative peripheral refraction and then take a call that's how i do it so then i prescribe what would come then case number 3 this was a 7 year old girl she had blurry vision in the right eye since 6 months again parents had history of moderate myopia there was parental myopia this was her refractive correction 4.75 and minus 0.5 gave her glasses therapy the usual things now you can see this is i've been following one of my oldest patients right from 2016 now it's to 2020 you can see the progression that slowly been happening over time and uh, everything else was good of course her lifestyle was really bad so we gave her good uh, modifications and at this point i started her on atropine so once i started her on atropine you can see there was a, a good uh, control with atropine up until march 2021 so here you can see again at this point exactly like i was telling the two year mark towards where it reached shoot up it just shot up into some unknown number so at this point i was wondering why why did this happen then i realized that probably the saturation effect was reached for atropine because the compliance was good everything else was good child's lifestyle was good so at this point i decided to not stop atropine rather i decided to do a combination therapy because atropine was working but suddenly we don't know what happened the threshold effects reached so i did a combination therapy mm-hmm. for this child did a dims plus dilute atropine and here you can see that it has definitely blunted the response i wouldn't say it has stabilized it completely but you can see the sharp rise that was there it kind of blunted it out a little bit so combination therapy definitely works there are two interesting studies that are not uh, now available with us uh, one study again you can see this uh, the combination group is the red one you can see it's much better than the atropine group alone or the dims group alone uh, definitely better than the control and you can say the same for the axial length as well the red line is the combination therapy has much better axial length control than either treatments alone this was another interesting study by huang et al and you can see that the combination therapy be actually l- creates a much better protective effect so combin- so my lesson number 3 is if you atropine responds but not as much as you would like to please try combination therapy because it definitely works okay on to my final lesson the same child progressed yes she progressed but it was i mean yes she st- stabilized a little bit but not to the extent that i would want her to so at this point i decided we have to look a little bit deeper so when i looked a little bit deeper you see that she said that oh no i play one hour day outdoor terrace uh, my new new work has come down uh, i mean I'm, i'm much better in a lifestyle behavior right now but what we did was we put her on a wearable light tracker 
just to see what exactly is happening and then when we actually found out that in two weeks when she came back the data showed she barely spent 23 minutes a day outdoors and barely 17 minutes on weekends so what they say may not necessarily relate to what actually is happening on the ground so then we realized that listen you may not you may be probably having a poor recall value you may be imagining spending one hour outdoors when you're probably hardly spending 20 minutes outdoors so then we gave her lifestyle re uh, re um, uh, modifications once again reinforce the whole thing uh, put her on a mobile phone application where they could kind of use the device for one month and they she actually realized that she wasn't spending enough time outdoors and once that happened you can actually see the blunting much better the left eye had almost stabilized and the right eye had also stabilized I didn't know if it was the carry on, carry on effect of the combination therapy or if it was a lifestyle but whatever it is it worked so lesson number four and the last lesson for me is when nothing works lifestyle re -mod -mod changes will actually work so please reinforce that so this is my last two slides for a pre-myope i prefer spectacle design because it's non-invasive for a new progressive myope i always do a relative peripheral refraction uh, then I, if the patient is ready for it, go for spectacle, otherwise atropine. If mm -hmm. the child has a peripheral myopic mm -hmm. defocus or an emetropic reflex, then I pr prefer a low-dose atropine as the first uh, thing. When it comes to resistant myope, by resistant myope, I mean refractive error plus axial length shows change. I divide them into poor responders and non-responders. Poor responders are the ones with, compared the previous six months progression to the after intervention six months, you see they responded but not too well then I consider them for combination therapy or increased dosage of low dose if they cannot uh, afford the glasses for the non-responders I completely shift them on to a secondary therapy like glasses or atropine thank you so much so always look at compliance and lifestyle yeah so this is a final video just to kids having fun and this is how life should be this is how kids should be you can see them pure joy on their face and this is what I would like to leave you with thank you Huh. So the next talk would be uh, Dr. Prachi's, I think. Yeah, we are. Yeah. It's 14 minutes long, so I'm going to be cutting it down. Okay, maybe Dr. Kuheli can uh, present and then we can have Dr. Prachi's. Yeah, makes sense. And it doesn't work even you've gone through their lifestyle as well you yeah. have an added advantage you have that watch which yeah. measures daylight but yeah. uh, our skepticism is also looked at we've tried everything uh, any suggestions how to tackle that or do you just say you know wait let's see what happens we don't have all the answers i think that's the first thing as uh, parents we should uh, make them understand we do everything we can yeah, that is available scientifically the evidence we try do peripheral refraction once again look at the lifestyle rework that uh, usually they respond to one or the other especially if they have a growth spurt at that time we really don't have anything in our control at that point so we explain everything but Dr. Jatanikar. can increase the dose. One yeah. percent works in most. Of oh them. yes, one percent. I have tried in one yeah, kit. One yeah. One works in yeah, one most works. of them because even one atom one, if you see, yeah, eighty percent of the patients responded to one percent. So one percent. Excellent I'll, suggestion. I'll tell you yeah. Story one percent. So one of my very uh, my son's batchmate, they came to me, myopic progressors. So I wrote atropine zero point zero one percent, and they went. And uh, three months later, they came, not a millimeter movement in their axial length. I thought maybe I started everything early, but the vision was really bad. They said, you could, she's not doing well in school. Yeah. So apparently they went to a chemist and they got 1% and they've been using it for three months. So that also happens. <laughs> so please be very careful with your prescription. That's they were, actually, they were actually faithful to you. Otherwise, I had similar experience. Uh, atropin 0.01% was around 230 rupees and atropin 1% was uh, 32 rupees. So these people went out and they thought that they will get it from their friend uh, chemist, friendly chemist. So they got one person and uh, then they came back that child is not able to see for near. So now we move on to the future of myopia management. Now, the question what next is something that the first time the patient comes to know, the parent comes to know that my child has myopia, their first question is, okay, doctor, what next? And you're like, okay, I'm going to start you on glasses. What next? I'm going to start you on atropine. What next? I'm going to do these measurements every three months. They're like, what next? Basically, they want to know when can we get LASIK done for my child? 
So what does the future hold for our myopic patients? What we need to know as pediatric ophthalmologists is that once a myopia patient, always a myopia patient. And our myopic, our pediatric patients with myopia grow grow up to be adults with myopia and we are their most trusted advisor to answer this question of what's next. Thus our myopia management cannot be restricted to knowledge of pediatric ophthalmology. So the first case is one of my patients, Om. Uh, then he was a 15 year old teenager okay so at the age of eight when he came to me he had uh, amblyopia first time detected with one eye of minus five diopters he went through intensive amblyopia therapy and finally at the age of 10 he had 6 6 vision uh, for his 10th birthday it was a big celebration then over the years, he uh, didn't do his patching very well, wasn't taking, putting his drops very well, and was not also doing his binocular vision therapy too much for the years of COVID. And at one point, he came and said he can't see very well with his amblyopic eye. And parents thought that was because he had stopped patching, he had stopped doing his vision therapy. But at this point, when I checked him, his vision was only finger counting in the left eye. And the fundus showed a retinal detachment we uh, uh, referred him and he got a scleral buccal surgery. Now, what is the management strategy here? The thing is regular follow-up of patients is very necessary. And we did have a lot of dropouts during the COVID years when they saw that, okay, the glasses number may be the same. And especially for unilateral myops or people with amblyopia, the child is also not complaining and they can uh, go away with it. The other thing is doing IDO at every follow-up. Again, dilating them, doing an IDO may not be, you know, something that we look into, but that is something that we need to counsel for. And because the child had had his counseling and he remembered my counseling on the detachment, he was the one who told his parents that I don't think this is normal. And they, of course, said, no, that's because you have not been patching. And the parents were very sure that he has dropped vision because he's stopped patching. But it was he at four, 15 years old. He said, no, I really need to go to Dr. Kohli. Whatever is the case during COVID, he was like, no, I know this is not normal. And so that's so important that we do a very good counseling for them. So the management trends have changed from primary vitrectomy uh, and for ex especially these young children who don't have posterior vitreous detachment to do a scleral buckle. This is what I learned from my retina uh, subspecialist. Now this is a second case. Now this patient incidentally happens to be from Cochin itself. So he took a video consultation with me. He had an exotropia and he wanted to come uh, for a squint surgery with me. He had right eye minus six diopters and a left eye with minus one diopter. And, uh, but he had six six vision in both the eyes. Now, the binocular vision showed that he had a left eye dominance. During our counseling, the conversation shifted. Do we do LASIK first or do we do the squint surgery first? And this is when I explained to him between anisometropia and anisokinia and that all six six vision is not the same. And finally, what happened is that there's a difference between between uh, you know the vision and after he got his LASIK surgery done his squint improved a lot and uh, then we tested for dominance and now he finally has vision therapy so this is the management uh, strategy that we want to test for dominance after the child has started wearing spectacles after even any myope has started wearing spectacles I, I would always check the three things which we've already spoken about after they've started wearing glasses is when I check for accommodative lag because we need to check the lag wearing their best, best corrected visual acuity the same thing with the peripheral refraction I will do it wearing them wearing their uh, spectacle correction and the third thing which we should not miss is checking for dominance in these uh, patients and giving them some kind of binocular therapy if required so this question comes up LASIK or squint surgery uh, should we do a LASIK surgery first or a squint surgery first in patients of myopia and I really like this study where they compared uh, 13 patients and they found that 11 of them there was no change in ocular alignment or binocular function but in two of the patients with high anisometropia which was the case in my patient 
who had a difference of minus four between the two eyes, they experienced an improvement in binocular function and their manifest deviation shifted to becoming intermittent or latent squint. And while I might have lost out on a squint surgery case, this patient, even though he's from Cochin, uh, he took a video consultation. He had consulted so many doctors all over India, but I was the only one who gave him a, a different perspective and he finally uh, did not need the squint surgery and you you get raving fans instead of just treating one one disease we need to treat the patient as a whole it's not just myopia happening to the patient it's not just squint happening to the patient it's a whole visual you know uh, the whole visual function is happening all at the same time for the patient now this is the thir uh, third case which is an 18 year old this must be happening so many times in our practice 18 year old she was a long time patient of mine and now she was traveling abroad for her higher uh, studies and wanted to get refractive surgery now as i said that we are the best people to explain to them about uh, lasik or uh, lasik or wavefront guided or uh, smile procedures and this is the workup which we need to do as pediatric ophthalmologists before we refer them to refractive surgeons that is doing a dry eye testing as uh, you know the pupil size especially in the dark especially important if the child has been on myopia treatment and most of these patients are on low dose uh, atropine and that is why we need to do this pupil size especially in the dark which you will see is different and many a time uh, I do counsel them that they might have glare because they have been on long-term uh, atropine uh, therapy, but she did not have after her LASIK and of course the wavefront and the corneal tomography. Now the uh, case four is again of a long-standing patient of mine. She was 21 now, uh, minus 15 and minus 18 diopters uh, spectacles and her number was not shifting. Now here the importance is that many a time we feel that the progression of myopia has stopped once the axial length has stopped growing or once the number has stopped changing. This was a long-standing patient of mine and uh, of course her vision was always poor at about 618, 612 but uh, since we were deciding to either shift her on getting an ICL which is an intraocular uh, collamer lens or a lens extraction and lens replacement surgery she was not a candidate for LASIK so these were the two options that we thought of and I did an anterior OCT as well as a posterior OCT now why do we want to do an anterior OCT and a posterior OCT in many of our myopia patients these days anterior OCT to check for vault oh, I'll just take 30 seconds and the posterior OCT uh, for any kind of PVD, ERM, uh, macular tractions. Uh, many of us think that myopia, we are only going to check the peripheral retina, which we do with the IDO, but we forget that uh, there is a lot of central retinal uh, conditions and uh, vitreous changes which happen with myopia. And myopia continues to progress even when their eyes have stopped growing. And uh, one of the biggest things is CNVM. And we have seen CNVM patients at uh, 21, 22 responding extremely well with anti-VEGF uh, injections. Just a single injection improves their vision a lot. So OCT angiography is what... Uh, we got done for her and uh, we saw some neovascularization uh, and she improved her vision just by one injection of anti-VEGF. Uh, and of course, I did a refractive lens exchange for her. This is the study uh, uh, which shows that a meta-analysis where they've shown that refractive lens exchange uh, works very beautifully in these patients and there is not the, the, the fear of retinal detachment that we always feel feared for a long time especially because we have such a uh, lovely uh, you know imaging that we can do and we can do their lasers much before we've done the um, refractive lens exchange so the take home message here is that there has been an advancement in everything in myopia right from early detection of myopia to machines that diagnose risk factors and early environmental modifications then there has been advances in the drops the glasses we've already spoken about the peripheral hyperopic defocus glasses the accommodative lag spectacles and we also now have the spectral light therapy which dr prachi spoke in our last session be it red light therapy or blue light 
light therapy there's a lot of advancements in that there is also advancement in our lasik and smile procedures and also uh, advancements in complications of myopia which always happen in our high progressive myops complicated myops uh, and we must look at the central retina peripheral retina as well as vitreous changes for our progressive myops thank you for your valuable time thank you thank you ma'am uh, something i would like to also add uh, is glaucoma because uh, high myops have a very different uh, approach to glaucoma for them yes and often oct is like, gives nothing oct gives nothing and that's often the the go to investigation for glaucoma for anterior segment surgery and the only way you can really look, talk about it is uh, hvf a uh, field and um, we burned our fingers yeah we burned our fingers we done a rle for a really high myope and uh, turned out that he had uh, steroid induced or pigmentary glaucoma and we had to go for migs because he was a young kid and that took toll and this guy who's 90 had to stay back for 6 to 9 months from his uh, university just for this so uh, now pre op anybody i do any investigation i also get a uh, fields done for all my ops yeah excellent point that's a very interesting point one more thing is uh, regarding the light therapy i i have no studies to back up for my thing but now i've started telling my kids any red light that they find at night the night lamps night lamps i uh, i generally tell them like you know you can use red lights just to see whether it helps giving them the yellow specs to the aesthetics and the other available at uh, many of the chemists they have the night driving goggles which mm. is like yellow specs is the next session the people of the next session here so i'm going to just take the liberty and play it for like 5 minutes uh, if there's someone from the next session here please come forward please please volume so my topic for today is the complex spine it's attached it's a toy is very close to his face the cyclopeic refraction revealed a refractive error of minus 8 in both the eyes and the fundus picture is as shown like a myopic tessellated fundus the child has been on regular follow up the parents were concerned with such high onset of myopia in such a young age and were obviously curious to know if something can be done for the management so we have just been following up this kid regularly and the refractive errors have been stable for the last 4 years so what is this type of myopia so this is a type of congenital myopia so let us look at the features of congenital myopia so we have high myopia with onset in infancy but the refraction tends to remain stable it has been reported that the refraction remain stable till up to even 20 to 30 years of age which has been the longest follow up and the fundus has very typical features of a tilted myopic disc a temporal conus and a posterior staphylococcus Moving on to the second case, this is a five-year-old child. This is a known case of high myopia on glasses since two years of age. There's a positive history of uh, myopia in the family. The current glasses that the child is wearing is of minus eight. Parents feel that the vision has reduced than before, and the glass power has been increasing. There has always been a history of the child taking off the glasses while viewing nearer objects. A cyclopeic refraction revealed that the myopia has increased to minus eleven. This is a fundus picture of the child uh, showing the myopic fundus with some myopic maculopathy. So, what is this type of myopia? So, this is a type of myopia called as a pathological myopia. So, we know that when the myopia is more than minus six, minus eight, associated with fundus changes, we call it as pathological myopia. Now the parental concerns was the child is so young the myopia is likely to progress and can any intervention be tried to try and reduce the progression So we obviously try to look up at the literature to see if something can be done uh say 3 to 4 years back we were not doing any pharmacological intervention in the form of atropine drops to try and reduce the progression However this study has probably changed things in that context So this was a study that uh, measured that study how low dose atropine drops were effective in children with high myopia, where 16 eyes of 34 children were included, and the refractive error bracket that was studied was 
high myopia in the range of minus 5 to minus 16.5. And this study showed positive results with myopia progression being controlled from baseline to second year, uh, with the control being better in the intervention group as compared to the control group. And they concluded that low-dose atropine drops can be used in high myopia as a measure to reduce progression. So even in the high myopia ca uh, cases, this option does stand for us as a control measure. The other option is an optical uh, control, wherein progressive lenses or multifocal soft contact lenses can be used, especially if the child is an accommodative lad. So I would like to say that uh, the correct estimation of the accommodative function of a child having myopia is also extremely important because there is a good subset of kids who do have a bit of an accommodative lag and a progressive lens or the uh, multifocal contact lens is a good viable option for control of myopia progression. Also, when we administer the uh, low-dose uh, atropine drops, that causes further lag in the accommodation and they become really symptomatic for their work. Moving on to the third case, uh, so this was a 29-week kid who presented with aggressive ROP as is seen in the fungus picture. The child underwent uh, intravitreal injections followed by laser for the ROP with good regression of ROP and the child has been doing well with respect to that. However, at eight months, a child presents with squinting of the eyes and very high refractive error in the range of minus 10 with an astigmatism of minus 3 and minus 2 in either eye. So what is this type of myopia? So this is myopia associated with premature. So what is different about this is basically the in premature babies, the ocular structures are still immature they, because they leave the uterus at a time when the ocular growth is not complete. Refractive media is formed in the last embryonic phase or just after birth. So when the babies are born early, it results in the arrest of the ocular growth. So what I mean by arrest in ocular growth is basically the normal emetropization process gets changed. So actual elongation of the eyeball is halted. The lens remains thicker and is anteriorly placed. The cornea remains steeper and the anterior chamber remains shallow. So the myopia in these kids is not of actual origin is, is one thing that we need to note. So is the refractive error likely to progress is the common question that pediatric ophthalmologists are going to get. So myopia of prematurity is a spectrum as is shown here. So it begins with myopia of prematurity, myopia spontaneously regressed ROP and myopia of laser ablation. So myopia of prematurity is likely to resolve by say around eight to eight months to one year of age. Myopia of spontaneously regressed ROP plateaus by two years of age and tends to remain stable. While myopia of laser ablation tends to give low to high myopia. Even in these subset of kids, the myopia tends to progress between say around till around two to four years of age. Then it tends to stabilize and sometimes can even reduce as the uh, the lens thickness and the corneas deepening tend to go down. Moving on to the fourth case, this is a seven-year-old child presenting with history of using glasses since four years. There is complaints of diminution of vision in the right eye since childhood in spite of use of the glasses. So the glasses power that the child is wearing is minus 4 in the right eye and the left eye is a plano correction. Vision with glasses is 6 by 24 and 6 in the right eye and 6, 6 and 6 in the left eye. Current refraction revealed uh, right eye to have a refractive error of minus 7 and the vision improving to 6, 9 and the left eye continues to remain plano. So this is a case of unisomyopia. So I'm going to take a minute to try and understand the glass prescription in these kids before moving on to talking about the control. So what is the factor that we need to look at in these patients is what would be the amount of induced anisoponia and should we undercorrect in view of anisoponia. So stating this rule uh, called as Jarmouth's rule of thumb for anisoponia. If the difference in image size associated with anisometropia is of refractive origin, then anisoponia produced will be about 1.5% per diopter of anisometropia. 
But since the anisometropy are mainly partly extreme, an estimate of one person per diopter is more useful. Let me try to simplify this a little bit. So a difference of one diopter causes a 2% difference in size of retinal images. A difference of up to 5% is well tolerated. Hence, anisometropy up to 2.5 diopters is well tolerated. Between 2.5 and 4 diopters is tolerated depending on individual sensitivity. And more than 4 diopters, it is not tolerated. So check for diplopia with full correction, okay? And get the HL and keratometry to understand what kind of myopia it is, whether it is an HL myopia or it is a refractive myopia. Now, why is this important? Because anisometropia can be because of HL length and refractive change. And that gets us to another rule called as NAPS rule. So if anisometropia is entirely HL and the correcting spectacles are placed in the anterior focal plane, the size of the retinal image would be identical to that formed by an emetropic eye that is same as the eye of the same refractive power. So if the child has binocular single vision with full prescription, that should be prescribed. Do not empirically undercorrect, assuming that the child will have diplopia. So to just sum it up, if the child has anisomyopia, which is actual in origin, full correction is warranted and do not empirically undercorrect the child. Now, do we want to start any therapy to control myopia progression in this kid? And are we uh, justified in doing so? Well, for this particular kid, when I have seen the kid for the first time, I would closely follow up the kid to document progression and increase in actual length and not start the kid directly on any therapy. If progression is documented, then we move on to our uh, control of pharmacological therapy using low dose atropine drops in that eye or even multifocal lenses is a good option. Moving on to the fifth case, a five year old child present with diminution of vision since six months. The child has had history of mind blindness. The child has been using glasses of minus three since one year. However, the refractive power has increased to minus five in both the eyes and child has uh, the best corrected visual activity is 612 in both the eyes. Uh, in view of the ninth blindness, an ERG was done which showed an attenuated B wave, suggestive for diagnosis of congenital stationary ninth blindness. Now, in this view, uh, our regular options of myopia control are there. Uh, so the actual limb had progressed as was documented by the measurement. Now, how do we intervene for these kids? Can we use low dose atropine do drops or do we move on to the, do we prefer to use the optical uh, method by using say peripheral defocus glasses or orthokeratology? Uh, well, so there are a few reports that, uh, there is this report by Dr. Kothari et al, which has reported selective reduction in the P50 wave on pattern ERG when low dose atropine drops were used. However, no effect was reported on full field ERG or multifocal ERG. There are reports contradictory to this, one of this by Dr. Jitani et al, who has stated that there has been no reduction in the ERG amplitudes in high and low contrast ratings. Minimal reduction in the low contrast ratings was reported, but by and large, it seems to be safe in even in, on the uh, retina and there seems to be no retinal side effects. Well, though, as it is a gray area, my personal uh, preference would be to go ahead with a peripheral defocused glass or orthokeratology in these cases as a primary intervention. If I'm not happy with the control, then maybe an addition of the low dose atropine drops can be considered. Moving on to the last case, uh, a seven year old child presenting with diminution of vision for distance, unaided vision was 624. A dry autoref revealed a refractive error of minus 3.5, which is variable, and cycloplegic refraction revealed a refractive error of plus 0.5. So, what is this? It's not a case of myopia, but it's a case of accommodative spasm, also called as pseudomatry. Uh, so, to sum it up, I have included cases uh, in this which do not fall into the regular school myopia or simple myopia case, cases where we have well elucidated measures for controlling progression. In this category of complex myopia cases, a thorough evaluation can help chalk an individualized plan for each myope. 
behavioral modifications which i have not included overall in the presentation forms an important and integral part of management in these patients uh, which includes increased outdoor exposure and uh, and uh, some measures to take in, uh, regular breaks for near activities and the future of myopia control seems to be very bright with lot of research going on and more and more uh, research pouring in to uh, to manage these patients better thank you thank you for your patient listening uh, so if there are any doubts because the next session has another 15 minutes to go because of some small time mismatch we were supposed to end by 10 but uh, i think on the printed paper a pen by 11 but on the printed paper there was a half an hour delay so yeah so we will wrap up the session thank you all for attending